So I'm eight years old, and my father tells me, tomorrow we're going to spend the day together. We have to go to a meeting in the city, and you have to come with me. And I think to myself, oh my God, I finally get to spend a day with my dad. This never happened in my house. I never had the opportunity to spend a day alone with him. It's just something that wasn't the culture in my home. But I was so excited because I remember as a little girl looking up at him and thinking, he is just amazing. I mean, tall, dark, handsome. He would walk into a room and everybody was magnetized towards him. And I thought to myself, wow, how does that happen? That's amazing. And I just wanted to spend that entire day with him because in my head, I fantasized what that day was going to look like. I had a job because he wanted me to translate for him. See, my family is from the Dominican Republic, so I became the family's free translator as a child. <laughs> it's okay. You know, I had a job. That was my job. But I also had an opportunity that day. I had an opportunity to spend the entire day with him, and it was great. And I thought we were just going to have a phenomenal time together. We would have lunch, we would be into the city, look at the skyscrapers, bump into rude New Yorkers, who cares? I was just <laughs> ready for it all, right? And so the next day comes, we wake up nice and early, we head over to the train station, and you know, he was tall, so his strides were long, so I would be running behind him, like, you know, make sure he didn't lose me somewhere along the way. And we get on that train, on the subway, and we finally settle in. I knew I had a long ride ahead of me. And as I'm sitting there, and the train car is swaying back and forth, I start to get really, really tired, really sleepy. And at one point, between wake and sleep, I kind of just lean into him. And then all of a sudden, boom, I feel a blow to the side of my ribs and I wake up. I'm in shock. I don't even know what's happening. I look over at the people in front of me and I see these two women staring at me and they have a look of both horror, they're scared, a little bit of disappointment. I'm trying to read them, but I'm not really quite sure. I see others standing and holding on to the rail and they're sort of giving me like a side eye, but I don't want to get involved kind of look. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I hear the screeching of the trains and the tracks. And I smell that like old cart smell, like they haven't cleaned it in a while. All of my senses are like super activated at that point. And finally, I looked up at my dad because I knew he would have the answer to what just happened. And when I looked up at him, he said, sit straight, get off of me, move over. And at that point, I realized that the blow to my ribs came from an elbow that he gave me to move me over. At that moment, it wasn't the pain of the physical blow to the ribs that broke me into a million pieces. It was the thought that at that moment, I had an understanding of what true rejection felt like right at that moment. See, I kind of knew because of conversations that I overheard that my dad really didn't want me. He certainly didn't want me then. He didn't want me when I was born and he didn't want me before conception. And so I kind of existed in this house when I knew that I wasn't wanted, that I wasn't really loved and cared for and that I had a father who didn't really want to nurture me and grow me as a child because he didn't care much for me anyway. And so that feeling of rejection started to plant its little seeds into my heart, into my soul, into the fiber of my very being. I began to see life through the lens of rejection. Well, that was at eight. And then at 13, something incredible happened. I get home from school and my parents sit me down 
and they say, Misa, we've decided that we're going back to our homeland. And I said, what? You've been in New York forever. Who goes back home? Like, this is a land of opportunity. <laughs> like, honey, milk, whatever. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Get it together, right? And I was like, well, I guess I don't have a choice. And they said, but we made another decision. You're not coming with us. What? Where am I going then? What do you mean I'm not coming with you? No, you're not coming with us. You're going to have to stay here. I'm taking your mother. Your mother and I are going back home, and you're going to have to figure it out. We're going to leave you with some family members, and you're going to have to figure it out. Can you just imagine this huge city and a 13-year-old little girl has to figure it out? figure it out. And I thought to myself, how did I move from rejection to abandonment? <laughs> right? And I didn't really know how to reconcile that, what to do. I remember running to my mother like in secret, like one day when he wasn't there. And I was like, Ma, I go to all these meetings with him and I know how to like figure it out. I can broker whatever we need. I got this. I can take care of you. I'm 13, but I can take care of you. Don't go. But she didn't choose me. She chose him instead. And they left. I've been doing this work for a really long time. I've been doing the work because I feel that in a lot of ways, my life was positioned to be able to do this. I understand firsthand the pain that people feel when they come into my practice. You don't have to tell me a story that I can't relate to because I relate to almost all of them. And for that reason is why I wanted to write my book, Urban Trauma, A Legacy of Racism. Because I started to understand that rejection has taken root in so many different aspects of our lives, and we don't even realize that it's happening. For me, it was in my family. For some of us, it's on, in our communities. For a lot of us, it's in our society, right? And I needed to make sense of what this was gonna look like because what I understood about humans is that we are biologically wired to have connections. I want to connect with you. I want to be with you. So what happens when you're rejected over and over and when you're abandoned? So I had to make sense of that, and I did. I created six characteristics that really are the outcome of the roots that it takes in rejection. And I have to tell you a story of a young girl that came in to see me. I remember that day because sometimes it's really striking. You know, the work that I do is heavy, but sometimes there are these stories that are etched in your brain forever. Mom comes into my office, dragging the 16-year-old in, sits her down, and she says, Dr. Akbar, you need to fix her. <laughs> Y'all didn't know I was a miracle worker, did you? <laughs> know it now? Okay. So I look at her like, oh boy, here we go. You need to fix her. Let me tell you what she's doing. She's out there having sex with all these boys. I think she's smoking weed. She's cutting out of class. She's failing out of school. And she's just plain old nasty and disrespectful. She's saying all this stuff in front of her daughter. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this poor child, hearing her mom berate her there. And at that point, I understood her pain. And abruptly, just like that blow to my ribs, she looks over at her mom and she says, Mom, see me, see me. 
Don't see all the behaviors and all the things that I do because I'm trying to make the pain go away, because I'm medicating in one way or another, because I can't take it anymore, and I do dysfunctional things to get your attention. See me, look at me. And that moment reinforced those characteristics. I'm gonna tell them to you because I think they're important and maybe somehow you can relate to them. That little girl, and I say little because she was 16, but she lived in a body of an inner child who was maybe five or six years old. We all have that inner child inside of us. She was angry, she was angry at the world because mom couldn't love her. She didn't know how to love herself and therefore she couldn't love anybody else. And anger was the rawest emotion that she was able to show in school, with her friends, with anybody else. She trusted no one. Mistrust guided every single step in her life. You weren't gonna do anything good for me. How could you? You were gonna hurt me just like everyone else does. She manipulated her way out of situations. But she manipulated for a reason, because sometimes through manipulation, you have the illusion that you can control the outcome. But many of us here know that that's not quite how it works, right? You can try as much as you can to control and manipulate, and at the end, what will be, will be. The other thing that she tried, that, that happened to her is that no matter what she did, whether it was fear, uh, whether it was success or failure, she feared all of it. She feared both her success and her failure. How many times are we in that position where we don't know what we're going to do because we have no idea what that roadmap looks like and we fear the unknown so much that we'd rather stay stuck and stagnant? And then she had the lenses of the world, which were rooted in rejection. That rejection made her see every single situation with the lens of perceptual misunderstandings. She perceived this and she perceived that. And sometimes it really wasn't based in any kind of reality, but it was her reality. Because at that point, her perception dictated the actions and the behaviors that she functioned by. The collection of all those things equal urban trauma. This is what it's about. And you know, when I do this work, which I've dedicated my life to, I mean hours of training, hours of preparation, hours of trying to understand it, both as a clinical professor at Yale and as a CEO of my practice, and now as an author. So I think I got a little bit of experience in it. <laughs> People say to me, well, what do you do with all this? How do you fix it? How do you begin to heal your urban trauma? And I graciously say to people, well, you don't heal it, but you can begin a path, a journey, towards healing and maybe get there. So I wanna leave you with really important tools today because I think that that is essential to our growth and development. There are five tools that I wanna give you. The tools are, if right now you are in a relationship that's toxic and dysfunctional, check it, understand it and know what it is because that will keep you cycled. I had to do that. I had to recognize all the people in my life that were toxic. And you know what? My mom was toxic. And that's real. It doesn't mean that because they love you or because you were born to them or because they have shared DNA that they're not toxic. They can still be very toxic. And start to understand that they have a different place and not necessarily in your inner circle. Begin moving towards how to have positive attachments. I learned about positive attachments from my fifth grade teacher. 
She was that, the one that saw me in the crowd of kids. She was the one that knew that I was going to get lost. And she pointed me out and she said, there's something really special about you that no one is noticing, but I notice. And no matter how much you misbehave, and no matter how many fights you get into, and no matter how many times you don't want to come to school, I'm going to love you and love you and love you until I break through that wall. And she loved me without condition. That allowed me to begin to move from a space where I thought myself a victim, a victim of my father's consistent abuse, a victim of rejection, a victim of abandonment, and I started to dig deep and find empowerment and find the warrior in me. That love allowed me to do that. It moved me from having a mentality of scarcity, there's never enough, there's not enough, I'm not gonna be able to do it, I don't have the resources, I don't have the potential, I'm not smart enough, it's never gonna happen to people like me, to understanding that opportunity is everywhere, everywhere. It also moved me from a place of hopelessness, of despair, where I thought there was nothing left for me. How was I gonna survive? How was I ever gonna become the person that I imagined I would become? It wasn't real for me. I couldn't grab it. I saw it as an insurmountable mountain that I could never get to the peak. But you know what? When you move from hopelessness to the idea of endless possibilities, every obstacle becomes another opportunity to do it better again. Every failure is just that, that thing that motivates you to find the seam, to figure it out, to conquer. The other thing that I did was understanding that if I continued to operate from a place of survival, every day trying to survive, no matter the circumstance, no matter who's, who I had to use, what I needed to do to get to the next day, to the next level, if I didn't understand that that needed to stop and actually claim the fact that my life was full of choice and that I had a choice to go this way or that way, and that I'm able to pause and breathe before I move forward, then I was going to stay stuck in a hamster wheel of just surviving. But I wanted more. And choice did come. And I can stand in front of you today because of the choices that I made. You know, when I listen to all the things that are going on in our society today, and I think about Black Lives Matter, and I think about the Me Too movement, and I think about those kids that are fighting, fighting like there is no breath left to make sure that there is gun violence reform with the March for Our Lives, and I think about what the LGBT community is doing, all I see are people fighting the idea that they've been rejected. They want a voice. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. See me. See me. I'm real. I'm human. I exist. I deserve the same. See me. You know that eight-year-old little girl in the train? The 13-year-old that got abandoned. The 16-year-old that was slept into my office. And the woman that stands here in front of you today is screaming, see me, see me. Thank you. <laughs>